Hey there, this is Dan. You're watching the Salty Sea, and I'm here with another edition of Mapping the Gnarlwood. We're going to get deep into the tactics of using monsters in Warcry. They are uh, a bit of a hot button topic because of uh, the way that some people feel about them in game. Uh, they can be very exciting, they can also kind of break some verisimilitudes for people, but they exist, they're here, and uh, they're worth trying out. I think you can often have a lot of fun with them depending on how you use them. I'm going to be talking about uh, how to play them most effectively, how to get the most out of them. If you're more concerned with how to beat them, I do have a Monster Hunter's Guide. That was my first edition of Mapping the Gnarlwood. Again, this series where I'm just going to get really deep into the weeds on Warcry tactics. Now the first thing to think about with monsters is uh, the very first thing in the game, which is deployment. Because of their greater size, when monsters are set up during deployment, they only need to be placed within three inches of their deployment point instead of wholly within three inches. That is from the core book. And that is a pretty big deal because you can have just a tiny bit of your monster on the battlefield and you can use that to really deploy in bad faith. I would say the other thing to note about monsters in deployment groups is you get to kind of set up combo groups with the rest of your warband a little bit more easily because your monster is going to take up an entire deployment group. You cannot deploy any other fighters in the group with that monster. And so the entire rest of your warband is in the two other groups, which means you can just do a lot with those since you're not going to be as restricted by, say, the even numbers rule or something like that. So let's take a look at what deploying in bad faith really looks like. So what do I mean by deploying in bad faith? Well, we can show you this board here, which has a Nurgle Chimera Warband facing off against an Iron Jaws Warband. My Gorgrentas are currently away at a painting competition, um, so I've used this Blood Crusher as my Gorgrenta. It's on the same base. But what you see is a setup for hidden treasures where we've got our five treasures around the board. And normally one deployment group starts right here, six inches, or sorry, nine inches from the center where you must be at least six inches away because you get to be wholly within three of this deployment piece right here. So normally normal fighters have to deploy, you know, right here. Um, a monster can deploy anywhere within three as opposed to wholly within three. So in this case, the terrain is actually preventing you from doing that, which again, a good reason why people should always include a lot of terrain. But just know that even though a monster cannot end a move action on top of terrain without falling off, it can uh, deploy on top of terrain. So you can actually deploy barely within three inches on top of terrain, this is a little precarious, so you'd want to deploy it better than that, but you can be completely, essentially outside of, of where you're starting. And now, now you're in a position where if this warband, Iron Jaws don't really do this, but if this warband had a plan for immediately coming up and bracketing your monster right away, now they can't do that. If the positions were reversed and we're putting these here, and I won't bother to move the rest of the Nurglings yet, but you can position so that you're only within, just barely within three of this deployment point. So you can position right here so that you are, should be 1.3 inches. Yeah, 1.3 inches from the center of the treasure. This is an absolute nightmare for any opponent because unless you have move six, and I'll show in a diagram in a minute, but unless you have move six, it is not possible to deploy in such a way where you can grab the treasure and get out of Dragon Maul range. Because the six inches for Dragon Maul lets you just immediately, any treasure taker who's move five or four, you can immediately just take them, put them on the back here, deal them a ton of damage, and now your warband is right there ready to kill them. Um, the same thing is true as far as deploying in bad faith for objective missions. If this were, um, instead of hidden treasures, if this were ley lines, it has the same layout with uh, objectives where these treasure tokens are, you can put, instead of being wholly within this three inch bubble of this deployment zone, if you're in your dagger, 
you can come out here where you are just barely within three, but now you're already counting on the objective and your two inch reach bubble actually crosses over the objective. Do you see this? It crosses past the objective so that you are actually taking up most of the contesting space without even having moved yet. Now, one little thing I want to correct from that demo is that it is possible for a move five fighter using rush to just barely escape out of DNM range, Dragon Maul range. Uh, you see here, if you have a deployment point and the treasure, you can nuzzle up to six inches away. You use rush, go 5.1 inches to where you can pick up the treasure, then back up 0.9 inches so that you're 1.8 inches away. And then your next move, you're allowed to move four inches. So you end up 5.8 inches away from the objective, or sorry, where the treasure initially was, which leaves you, what would it be, uh, six point, you know, seven inches from the monster. So you would be just barely outside of Dragon Maul range. Uh, move fighters have a way when they're using rush that is a little shady with the rules, but right now rules as written, it is legitimate where you would move up five inches be just outside of where you can pick up the treasure. Then on your next move, you're using rush and you just come up just a tiny bit, take the treasure and then go, you know, 4.8 inches or so back. And that leaves you uh, just like 6.1 inches or so from, from the monster. Uh, which is which is great. That's exactly what you're looking for. And so you'll you'll end up fine there. Uh, though again, the way that picking up treasure slows you down and the way it doesn't slow you down if you go up to a treasure don't pick it up and then on your second move you pick it up as the very first thing you do as part of your move has always kind of sat odd with me doesn't feel like it's exactly what they meant when they wrote the rule but hey that's fine uh so let's get into actually using these monsters now in game. And the thing that I've already been referencing is Dragon Maul, and it's the main thing we need to understand when we use monsters right now. Uh, so the first thing, pick a visible enemy fighter within six inches of this monster. Remove that fighter from the battlefield and set them up within one inch of this monster. Then roll a number of dice equal to the value of this ability. For each four up, allocate three damage points to that fighter. If that sounds crazy, Yes, it is crazy. It is one of the best abilities in the in the entire game. Now, it's great for a couple reasons. The first is you are teleporting fighters away. You're not even just pulling them. Like for, say, a Great Bray Shaman ability that people already love. You are actually just picking them up and placing them, which is incredible in terms of the obstacles that you can cross and the way that you can put them on the other side of your base. Monsters, this is going to come up a lot, are the base is 4.7 inch long for 120 millimeters. Uh, that's a big, long base. That's more than a 10 inch teleport. If it's six inches from the front of your base and then you teleport it one inch behind your base, that's like an 11 inch teleport. That's insane in terms of get, putting them somewhere they don't want to be. You can often put a treasure carrier surrounded by your own fighters. So even once you kill it, uh, it can't just hand the treasure to someone else. Uh, a lot of really powerful things. And then on top of that, it even deals damage. And it deals significant damage, too. If this triple is on a high value, like 5 or 6, uh, you could easily be doing 6 or 9 damage with it. Now, the thing of when to use it is really important. Because as a triple, you're probably only using it once per round. So you really need to take a look at a good look at your opponent's warband, and you need to know what to expect. Uh, you need to take a look at which things in your opponent's warband are hard to one-shot kill. Uh, knowing, I put a table of what survives a Dragon Maul hit from a Chimera. Uh, knowing about how much damage you expect to do for each toughness is really important when you have a monster in a way that it's not as important for say having a whole ton of chaff where you know their job is to have to be in position and have their damage add up over time you don't need to memorize their damage tables stuff like that for a monster it is maybe worth it to at least know what your odds are for doing 20 damage to toughness for things like that uh, for the given monster that you've brought 
And the other thing is you really want to take a look at what terrain looks like. Uh, where are the places where you can go to Dragon Mall things? And then once you Dragon Mall stuff, how, how can you corner it with terrain? Uh, and then the other thing is going to be sequencing, sort of when you use Dragon Mall in your activation sequence, you know, which of your three activations you use it for. Uh, the, the main thing I would say is to prioritize your monster's brackets and resist the urge to activate your monster unless it's kind of actively in danger. And I just wanted to show a little demo to show what I mean by that. So you can use the big base and the movement and then the incredible reach from Dragon Maul for, for monsters to dictate the target priority of your opponent. So we have here just a, a really quick and dirty example of a chimera that is sort of assumed the position in ley lines. Now, what I mean by that is in ley lines, the monster base allows you to be contesting two objectives at once while also covering one objective with Dragon Maul. Um, you can do that with the two short side objectives, or if this scatter terrain wasn't there, this, this bloodthirster proxy would be able to do it counting on these two objectives, covering this objective with Dragon Maul. You can do that in a bunch of different ways. Um, and so that's really nice. The big base allows you to do that. The board is 22 inches long. Each objective is six inches from the side of the board. Uh, that's 10 inches left. Then you have three inch uh, contesting range. That's four inches left. And a monster base is 4.7 inches. So you now have this sequence, we've got this set up where let's say this is the beginning of round two. So everyone's gotten into position around their objectives. And you have these two Nurgle Plague Bearers who are facing down an Annihilator Prime. Now the Annihilator Prime point for point is the biggest nightmare for monsters. It's only 180 points, but monsters can't afford to let one hit them. This Annihilator Prime, if it uses Onslaught, is almost guaranteed to kill both of these Plague Bearers in one activation. So there's a big temptation to want to get it out of there. You are covering the Prime right now with Dragon Maul. So if you wanted to, you could put it here in a place where it can't contest either of these two objectives. And because it's so slow, it wouldn't be able to contest the objectives without disengaging and going over there. But what I would just want to communicate here is that your Chimera is the most important fighter on the board. So it's almost never worth it. Even if this were, say, a treasure mission and one of these was the treasure carrier, it's almost never worth it if you get to go first to actually sort of make your opponent prioritize the monster. If, you're, if your opponent is in a position where they are fighting your chaff, that's always where you want them to be if they have fighters who are capable of dealing with monsters. So in this situation, if you get to go first on this objective, you're much better off disengaging with one of them, maybe attacking once, then disengaging, even though you're likely not to do any damage when you attack, and then just letting this other Plague Bearer just die. Then your Annihilator Prime has already activated, and that's when you can drag him all and start fighting it. So if possible, you should always be using your Dragon Maul to put your opponent's fighters in danger and never use it to put your own monster in danger uh, to save your fellow fighters, unless this is round four and this is deciding the game essentially by saving a fellow fighter, something like that. Otherwise, you generally want to keep your monster safe because it is what's going to whittle down your opposing, opposing warband. Now, another thing to just really quick remember with Dragon Maul is the way it interacts with terrain. So one of the places where monsters are vulnerable are, of course, in treasure missions where uh, treasure carriers, you know, big things can carry treasures where monsters can't carry treasures themselves. Their goal really is to drag the treasure carrier close to their own fighters. Now, a thing that you need to be careful for is when you have a monster and you're looking to Dragon Maul something on three inch high terrain, which is the height of most of the terrain in Warcry. Dragon Maul says you can take something from six inches away. So from here, six inches would cover this treasure carrier. However, you have to note that at three inches high, the hypotenuse of the right triangle you're creating to this treasure carrier uh, is 
the square of 30 of 6, which is 36, minus 9, which is the square of 3. So it's only 5.2 to the treasure carrier. So from here, for example, this treasure carrier is within 6 of this chimera, which is being locked in place by some uh, annoying little goblins. And it's not within, even though it's within 6, it's not within 5.2. So you actually can't drag and maul uh, this squig hopper here. So those are some things to keep in mind when playing against fast warbands that are going to get onto that terrain, when playing against elite warbands that can actually put your monster in danger if you dragon maul them towards you, things like that. Now, you kind of have to play pretty differently when going up against really swarm warbands, where each individual fighter isn't really a threat to you, but you are looking at being zoned out of going where you want to go. Now, if you talk to or listen to the uh, Tabletop and Beyond podcast folks who I uh, podcast with once a month, uh, they'll talk a lot about how oftentimes the very first movement of the game is where they want to jump onto the most important part of the board. And after that, they might hope to not move at all. And I think that's really good advice in general. So you want to claim the board really early with a monster if you can. So with your very first activation, often your very first activation of the entire game, uh, you'll want to claim your spot on the board, your favorite spot on the board. This is also important in monster versus monster battles because um, you will not want to be the first person to go within Dragon Maul range, but you'll want to have the choicest spot on the board. So if you go first, you really want to use that activation to, to get a nice spot on the board where you can do a lot of damage. Now the problem is, after that, you really want to protect your monster's activations because having the last two activations of a round with a monster is one of the most powerful things you can do because you can do things like move and attack, Dragon Maul and attack twice, things like that that are just like an avalanche of damage and power and, and power projection to which you can do. So the second step after you claim your space on the board is going to be to use the rest of your warband to pressure your opponent uh, to, you know, go take things out if you can, to zone them out of, you know, places where they might be scary for your monster, things like that. And then your second and third activations for your monster are just going to be killing stuff as quickly as you can. Uh, the only time I would interrupt that kind of plan is if you're in danger of getting bracketed by an opposing threat, you might try to take that threat out early. Uh, if you're really worried about, say, a treasure carrier getting an activation, uh, you might drag and maul. That would especially happen in rounds uh, two or three. You might drag and maul as your first activation and then try to wait out the second and thirds towards the end. Uh, this is going to be a lot harder in games where your monster comes out in round two. In fact, against prepared opponents, uh, you're going to you're going to be kind of on the back foot there. Uh, so you'll want to focus on getting as many kills as possible in round two. But the general theory still applies. And I just want to show another demo to kind of show what I mean here. So to talk about playing against zone defense, I'm going to be putting down my Nurgle monster here and focusing on a corn one. Now, we've got a corn warband here that is actually very similar in structure to a Slaves to Darkness warband that recently won a large tournament in the UK. We've got our Bloodthirster standing in for a Chimera, a Skullmaster, a Gorehound, and a Bloodletter. We've got a Hidden Vault scenario set up here. There is uh, three objectives, one here, one here, one here. In this one, the camera can't see, but it's in the middle of this terrain. And we're facing off in this fairly elite monster force against an incredibly numerous Karadran Overlords force. We've got five dwarves over here. Uh, this Stormcast is standing in for another one of these Tempest Eye supercharging ally dwarves. So we've got four more dwarves over here, and we know that four more dwarves are coming on uh, in round two, whereas we've only got two fighters coming in on round two. This is a scenario where at the end of the game we're going to have we're going to have to win on numbers on one of these three objectives. And we're not going to be able to do that unless our monster can get to a place where it can be clearing dwarves off the battlefield at a fairly high rate, while at the same time protecting certain objectives and positioning for certain objectives. Now, the scary thing about playing against such a high numbers force here is that 
um, they could zone off the board pretty quickly. We have a decent amount of terrain here so that uh, we have a number of reasonable options with no dwarves on the board for getting our Bloodthirster into the center of the board. But it's going to be very difficult to do that if we allow them time to get going. So you're going to want to, let's say they go first, they're going to have options to put dwarves in places that start to really constrain where you can land. So with a dwarf here, you can still get there, um, but they could easily just use a dice to move extra. They could also be popping their uh, AOE move buff to be able to move a ton of dwarves all around here. So you're generally going to want to spend your first activation claiming a good spot on the board even though it might be tempting to try and hunt down, say, the important support hero or to start just dragon maul and killing dwarves, things like that. You really can't focus on that. You need to claim an important piece of the board. So even if they bring a dwarf here so that you can no longer come anywhere around here, you just need to land here right away so that you can at least claim a spot on the board. Now that's going to allow them to get a couple hits into you. You're going to need to live with that um, because if they manage to throw dwarves all across this board using their movement buffs, all of a sudden you're going to find that you can't go anywhere on this board, in which case you're just not going to be able to clear enough dwarves over the course of the game to win on these objectives, especially considering how many more of them are coming onto the board. That's going to be generally true against any Swarm Warband, and it's especially troublesome when you're playing a really elite slice of monster warbands um, like this corn one I've created here. So that example is sort of an idealized version of, of the problem where that Dwarf Warband, that Karadran Overlord's Warband, is more capable of zoning you out than just about any Warband you'll see. They've got 13 fighters, they've got a really fast one, they've got move buffs, uh, but what they don't have is they only have one thing in that Warband that can bracket you on its own, and that's the Mizzen Master. And so that's a situation where you can really afford to just jump down anywhere and just tank a couple activations from dwarves before you start just killing them. Now, that'll be less true against, say, a warband where they have a couple hammer pieces and then all chaff, but those ones will be worse at zoning you out, and you'll also just be able to claim space that's not right in front of the hammer pieces. Uh, you'll just need to use your judgment, making sure that you end uh, beyond just an easy charging range, just making sure that they can't ever come in and get two hits on you. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is playing monster warbands against other monster warbands. And the, the most important thing is uh, winning the brackets battle. Uh, so striking first is all important. It is the most important part of fighting monster versus monster. And that starts with positioning. Uh, you always want to place yourself where you have room to put the opposing monster on a Dragon Maw. Uh, and I'll show you a demo right here to show what that means as far as the terrain on the board. So the first thing you're going to want to think about when you have a monster warband against another monster, uh, before you even worry about sequencing, is uh, positioning and where you put your monster. So if you take a look at the two, uh, the Chimera and the Bloodthirster Chimera that I've got on the board here, uh, we've got a situation where um, if this Bloodthirster wants to Dragon Maul the Chimera, there is nowhere valid on the board for it to put it. So you can't actually achieve that goal. Whereas if this Chimera goes to Dragon Maul and attack this Bloodthirster, they can put it here, they can put it here, they can't put it anywhere else, but they have two pretty reasonable options of where they want to put it. So it behooves you to try to actually create open space around your monster if your opponent has a monster. Um, so if I was, for example, in a mission where you're sort of arraying anywhere on the table, I would want to hug some of this terrain so that, I mean, at this point, we're not actually six inches 
away, but I would want to hug this terrain so that I have room to stick their monster right here um, by creating room next to me right there. So to give yourself always an option to be the first monster striking. So assuming you've placed yourself in a situation that gives you room to maneuver, room to uh, hurt your opponent with Dragon Maul, you're now kind of squared away. And unfortunately, if your opponent has done the same thing and you're kind of standing off from each other in certain parts of the board where you can't move towards the other fighter because if you come in towards them and then they get to go next, they get to Dragon Maul now because you started it, that's a real problem. The other thing that you see, and the reason why it's a problem, is that striking first is incredibly important. Uh, even a Chimera can lose to a non-Chimera monster if they take 20 damage in the first attack, right? And Gorgons, Hell Pit Abominations, Slaughter Brutes, all of them have pretty good ways to do this in just one activation. All of them can Dragon Maul and then attack and expect to do that to you or you know the slaughter brute can uh, sometimes get two attacks in it's all very scary and then a lot of the sort of death and order war bands can also be just flooding the board right a charybdis with a bajillion archaeo arcanauts a terror geist with a billion skeletons going around right all of them can try to out activate you and then have the last two so striking first is really important so let's talk about how to sort of actually get so that you're striking first because you're essentially going into a game of chicken as i talked about these monsters can't charge each other so the the way to kind of beat the standoff is based on what else is in your warband so let's talk about kind of how to support monsters and what can work really well so if it's important to make your opponent blink first in the stalemate a lot of what you need to do then comes down to what else is in your warband. So here I've got three monster warbands, and I just want to talk a little bit about, you know, what tools each of them have at their disposal to force the other person to, uh, to act first and to put themselves at a disadvantage in the, in the monster fight that's kind of inevitable uh, when these two types of warbands fight each other. So the first one, is going to be pretty familiar if you've been following the channel. This is a uh, Nurgle Chimera uh, with a bunch of plate bearers, the Sloppity Bile Piper. Now, the big advantage that this warband is gonna have in any kind of monster confrontation is the fact that these plate bearers are very cheap, 50 points. So every time your opponent's monster takes out a plague bearer, they're only taking out 50 points worth of stuff, whereas if their warband is backboned by all of these blood reavers, you get 65 points every time you take out one of their things. The math eventually just starts adding up in your favor over the course of the round, which puts your opponent in a very awkward situation where they become actually pretty desperate to try to take your monster out because your chimera is just going to be doing just going to be taking bigger chunks out of their warband than they are than they are for your warband. Um, which makes this warband really powerful. Um, moving on to this corn chimera list, um, we don't have those kinds of numbers. We only have one cheap fighter, and that blood letter is 80 points still. That's not all that cheap. But what you do have is things like this gorehound is able to, because of Hungry for Flesh, the ability to kind of get a free move action at six inches, an opposing monster like this Chimera can't jump in to attacking range of the Gorehound without putting itself in danger of this ability, where now all of a sudden this fighter can jump in, attack twice, bracket the monster, and now you're in a terrible position where this uh, Corn Chimera can um, just absolutely ruin your day. Uh, the same is true where this Skull Master is able to take a hit from an enemy monster and then start attacking them, then double attack them. Um, and so you have these tools to uh, pressure and make opposing monsters pretty nervous. And so that can actually help you make up for the fact that you've really not got the numbers. 
A similar concept is kind of going on over here. You only have one more number. Now, this is a Stormcast-themed warband, so I'm saying that their Chimera, or sorry, their Charybdis is actually this uh, Stormstrike Chariot here. But you've got your Castigator Prime, who is capable of bracketing an enemy monster from very far away. So right from the start of the game, enemy monsters are under a ton of pressure just from this Castigator Prime. And then they don't have a single target in the entire warband that they can uh, just blow up with ease. All of the, these Annihilators, the basic Annihilators, a Chimera is 60% likely to take them out in one shot with Dragon Maul. Non-Chimera monsters, it's just not happening. Um, and even at 60% likelihood, the 40% chance of failure essentially comes with losing the game since these Annihilators with two attacks can uh, do a ton of damage to your monster. And then this Annihilator Prime is essentially immune to being one-shot killed from monsters, and then it's just an absolute existential threat to a monster. So um, this kind of has a similar uh, play style of just putting your mo the opposing monster under a ton of threat right from the beginning, which then lets your monster, aka this Stormstrike Chariot, uh, be able to be a lot more flexible when it comes to running wild in the game. Um, I want to talk about some of the other Grand Alliances too. So uh, Destruction has a lot of these tools where they have access to the Gargant. Uh, the, here's my Gargant proxy, even though it's not on the correct base. Uh, but you can get yourself in some trouble depending on how you support it. So if you're supporting it with, say, lots of Ard Boys, Ard Boys are really powerful, but um, opposing monsters tend to be able to still chew them up, and then you know losing 80 points there is a problem. Uh, the same is true with Boingrop Bounder bosses, where I found that they're just so fragile that as soon as a monster just takes them out, you've lost 200 points. That's a massive disaster. But you do have reasonable options here when you are playing Destruction uh, with netters, which can fill out uh, Destruction soup lists that have um, just coming from Gloomspite gits. And then also things like Mega Bosses, things like uh, Brute Bosses, are incredibly threatening to opposing monsters as well. And that's really important given that the Gargant right here is uh, is actually not that great at winning monster fights with a lot of the really scary chaos monsters, with some of the death monsters, things like that. So having those good support pieces is really important. Finally, I just want to talk about some models that I think are really powerful but are just non-starters in these types of monster versus monster games. Um, Things like this Mizzen Master has the same problem that this Boingrop Bounder boss has. They're both amazing fighters, but uh, monsters have too easy a time taking them out, and uh, they cost too many points for how easy that is. The Slan Star Master has a really similar problem, and also that ability is something that you happily take the Slan for its ability, but all of a sudden when you're using your triples on Dragon Maul, you're you're not really getting all those dice. Now, the Heart Eater and these Blood Warriors, I think Blood Warriors are amazing. They're an incredible existential threat to Plague Bearers because for 110 points, uh, this guy will absolutely chew through Plague Bearers. He'll kill a Plague Bearer every round, and they're going to have a really tough time putting enough damage onto him to be able to take him out. However, being able to kill a Plague Bearer every round isn't really all that attractive when this Chimera here can potentially kill two of him every single round as well. And so you're just, you're not going to have enough of them on the board to actually deal with these Plague Bearers. Uh, the same is true of this Heart Eater. This Heart Eater is even better at taking down Chaff than uh, the Blood Warrior is, but it has the same problem of, um, of just getting absolutely toasted by these monsters. You know, at 200 points, the fact that this War Hydra here, or this Charybdis, can net him, can 
Dragon Maul and then deal, say, 12, 15 damage to him, and then, you know, potentially he could get one shot killed from something that's not even a Chimera, uh, is just way too hard to spend 200 points on, even though in non-monster fights, this is an incredibly serviceable model. One. So hopefully that gives you some ideas about the types of models you can use to support your monster. Uh, when I first saw monsters, I really thought it was all going to be about activations or nets, either nets to stop opposing monster hunters or activations to just make sure that you get to go last with your monster. Those are both very, very important and very true, but we've seen that there are other options too. Fighters that can make opposing monsters uncomfortable and generally be solid in combat are great because they make Dragon Maul uncomfortable for your opponent, so now they don't have ways to really chunk down your warband while you're killing theirs, which then forces them to want to come into your monster to attack you. Uh, things like really fast uh, damaging fighters that can actually go in and bracket the opposing monster or can just be winning on the mission, something like just if you have an incredible treasure car carrying fighter like that Gorehound or, you know, like a Varengard, all of a sudden your opposing opponent's monster really needs to go track that treasure carrier down. And now all of a sudden your monster gets to focus on killing the opposing monster while they focus on taking down your treasure carrier. So those are things that can kind of give you a nice advantage there and hopefully give you some ideas on ways to build warbands that support monsters uh, for yourself. Now, what do those warbands actually look like in competitive play? And I will say this is kind of the first time here where I'll actually talk about where they are in the meta right now. Monsters were 10, 3, and 3 at the Warhammer World Tournament. Uh, that's about a 75% win rate if you have those draws be one win and one loss and you take out the one uh, mirror match that they had. And so 75% win, per win rate is really, really high, and that kind of roughly tracks to other tournaments as well. Uh, you do see monsters getting beaten, but you see them winning way more than you see them losing. And so the question is, how much of this is just monsters just face roll win? Um, I think when I look at the lists at these tournaments, I think that most of these tournament monster warbands appear like they've been built by competitive players who just think that that's the strongest thing, so that's what they're building. And so when you look at the really competitively built lists at tournaments, um, a lot of them have monsters, a lot of them don't, but those are generally ones getting put in a winning position. You rarely see monster lists like, say, the all Dankhold Trogoth list that I showed in one of my videos. You rarely see things like that in tournaments, so there's not a lot to kind of bring the monster win rate down to where what it would look like if casuals and competitive people were both playing a lot of monsters. Now that said, there's not a lot of casual monster lists that I think are totally trash. Uh, other than the Arachnorok Spider, I don't think there's any monsters that are just absolute trash right now in the meta, and you can you can definitely put competitive warbands together around any other monster. But the Chimera, if we're going into kind of my hot takes about where I think they are and should be in the meta, the Chimera is the only one that I think is wildly out of bounds competitively. Uh, as far as if I'm thinking about winning a tournament, do I feel like I need to take a monster if the Chimera is nerfed? I really don't think I do. Uh, I think I'm very happy taking a non-monster list, and I'm also very happy taking a monster list if the Chimera is not there. Now, if, if it is Chimera, it's I'm either taking that or I'm taking a list that specifically can stand up against it, and I'm probably taking the Chimera. So I do think that that one is in a problematic place in terms of its uh, just its tune. It's just overtuned, undercosted, uh, just does too much damage. But the other monsters, I think, are very reasonable from a competitive standpoint. Now, the issue with saying they're reasonable competitively is, are Warcry tournaments competitive? Not really, to be honest with you. Um, I think about a third of the people who go to the average Warcry tournament are thinking about the list they build as something that they hope will win the tournament. 
and two thirds are not. Um, probably another third are just building, are just bringing like whatever cool stuff they wanted to play that day, and then another third are bringing something that, you know, it's it's got a real plan to it. They hope it does well. They'd prefer to have a winning record, but they don't expect to be winning the tournament at all, and that's great. But that does put the community in an odd situation where I think it's pretty reasonable for average players to say, I don't want to have a class of fighters that invalidate about 80% of the fighters in the game. Uh, I think it's reasonable for people to say that. But I also, you know, I, I definitely feel for sort of competitive players who really like monster v monster combat, uh, people who just think monsters are cool and want to run them and like that they can win with them. I feel for that because it is, monsters are very beatable. Even the Chimera is beatable. Uh, I've definitely, like I've done well against it in testing. I've also found that you know, you're usually in the driver's seat with the Chimera and the other person is trying to get fancy and pull tricks and kind of sort of make this house of cards work against you where it can work, uh, but but the Chimera player is certainly in the driver's seat every time I've tested it. So I would say that's kind of a, a discussion for TOs to have on their own. That's just kind of where I think it's at. Now for players, the question is, if I'm bringing my monster, how do I convert that kind of 75% win rate expectation into a 4-0? And, and I hope that this video has kind of given you a sense, and I just want to reiterate, it's going to be about positioning. It's going to be three Ps, positioning, patience, and priority. So positioning just being claim the most efficient space on the board. I, where do I wish I was? And try to spend your very first activation doing that, getting there or covering that space with your Dragon Maul so that opposing monsters can't claim it for themselves. Uh, anytime you can contest multiple objectives at once, do that whenever possible, and just grab that spot early. Uh, patience, once you're in position, forcing out opposing activations is very powerful. Generally, save your third monster attack for the last thing you do. Uh, if you can, save your second monster activation to be the second to last thing you do, and that can be really helpful. And then last is priorities. This is generally true in competitive Warcry anyway. Keep an eye on the opponent's highest value target and their biggest threat, and really try to recognize that those aren't always the same thing. You often want to keep their biggest threats away from your monster uh, because you want to focus your monster on just tabling their warband. <laughs> and you can't do that if their big threats manage to get into your monster and distract it. So just protect your monster's brackets more than you protect your chaff. Even though you're you know, losing f entire fighters, losing numbers on the board just to avoid taking, say, five damage with your monster, that's almost always worth it because you want your monster at maximum efficiency. So... If this has been helpful for you, please consider uh, subscribing, liking the video, uh, joining up on my Patreon. I will certainly be doing more tactics videos in the future. Uh, I also plan to do some, uh, some hobby focus and some uh, event focused coverage as well pretty soon coming up. So uh, I'm really excited for that whole mix of stuff. And so until those come out, may all your roles be crits.